My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCann.com. This podcast is entitled, The Key Question, from the Global Petroleum Show. At the Global Petroleum Show in Calgary in 2019, I fielded lots of questions about digital in oil and gas. But this was the number one question, and it's not what you think. First of all, I'm very grateful for the team at Energy Now, who invited me to attend the Global Petroleum Show as their guest, hold a place of honor at their large booth, and sign copies of my book. Our position was strategically located at the intersection of two large aisles with great sight lines and plenty of passers-by. I shared my time with another Calgary author, David Yeager, who has written a book about the history of the Alberta oil industry called From Miracle to Menace, Alberta, a Carbon Story. The Energy Now booth was distinct among the rest of the show because it featured not one, but two authors. While I didn't keep track of numbers, I did sell 21 copies of my book, or one every 20 minutes or so, of booth time. Not what you'd call a brisk pace, but considering the circumstances, I was well pleased. Most people attending a conference have been trained to expect stuff for free. Exhibitors gave away trinkets, pens, booklets, toys, and other items embossed with their brands, and a few booths even gave away reusable swag bags to carry all the loot. But my book is not free. Convincing someone who's conserving their shekels for an overpriced site lunch to pony up for a one-pound paperback that they have to lug for the rest of the day takes some selling skills. Aside from describing what the book was about, my key message is that while the book, ebook that is, is lighter, weightless in fact, and cheaper by two-thirds, you can't get the author's signature on your Kindle. That seems to work, although I also point out that my signature is all but worthless, unless it's on a check. So what questions did the booth visitors ask? Well, just the usual sort. What's the book about? The answer is the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. Not just upstream, but midstream, downstream, services, capital projects, turnarounds, and much more. What is the impact of digital? Well, digital will be responsible for the likely quick addition of 500 billion barrels of new reserves, worth $22 trillion, the slow destruction of up to 50 million barrels per day of transportation consumption, a steady reduction in industry costs of at least 20%, and a minimum 20% gain in productivity. Why did you write it? Most other industries that have ignored the impacts of digital innovation have regretted that decision. Oil and gas has already ceded their mantle of most valuable industry to the digital industry in the space of just 15 years. The pace of adoption must speed up. Can I get the book online? Of course, a book about digital innovation needs to be available in digital format, and the audio ver version was released in August. How ironic if it was not available across the digital media spectrum. Is it really a bestseller? Yes, in Canada, and in the narrow category about books for oil and gas and mining. Although my wag of a son reminds me not to get too excited about that accolade. He suspects that oil and gas people don't read, and that miners can't read. I suspect that many visitors to the booth are also thinking to themselves, why should I care? And how will digital impact me and my company? These are harder to answer without a deeper dialogue than affordable at a busy booth at a noisy and distracting trade show. People say, I'm not interested in many ways, but the most memorable line after my pitch was, digital is way above my pay grade. That guy struck me as the walking zombie employee, oblivious to the changing world and lacking any curiosity about how his job was in the crosshairs of the 20% of productivity improvement. I wished him well. The big question. Two book buyers posed the hardest question of all, which takes considerable time to answer. Both chaps are in their 20s, I think, and partway through their engineering training, with their eyes set on the oil and gas industry. They are convinced that the future of oil and gas must feature a lot more digital, but are baffled at the complete lack of digital content in their university training programs. The conversations are more rich than what I usually get at a trade show and touched on a number of critical themes. How is it possible, after the jet-propelled growth rates of the digital sector for over a decade, 
that their university level engineering training doesn't even acknowledge that digital is a thing? What are their job prospects when they reveal at their expected job interviews that they have no training at all on data science, machine learning, and other key digital topics? Should they simply abandon their degree programs now before they invest too much more in what appears to be training themselves for a market that doesn't exactly exist? What additional technical skills should they acquire that will position them favorably in three to five years' time? And what can they do to bolster their chances of finding a job working largely against the grain of the university-imposed program? All good questions, I thought. The paradox for students in engineering today is that their university education is supposed to train them up for the job market. This degree, along with those in computer science, business, dentistry, medicine, and law, is intended to create a job-ready professional. But students aren't stupid. They know that the job market, particularly in Alberta for oil and gas engineers, is tight. The downtown office towers are still vacant. The city crawls with job hunters in oil and gas, many with lots of prior experience. The transaction market is slow. Production in the province has been curtailed at least once. Pipelines aren't getting built. And the federal government is hell-bent on gumming up the works with bills like C-69 and C-48. Interesting new employers like Amazon pass the province by because the workforce lacks the skills for the new economy in areas like data science, coding, and machine learning. Alarmingly, for a student investing $100,000 in their career, a flood of money now seems to be gushing towards training up the legions of unemployed in these hot new areas, whereas their degree programs feel stuck in the 1990s. Of course, undergraduate degree programs aren't exactly at the forefront of human knowledge. Our base of scientific understanding is constantly evolving and expanding, and universities are typically primary contributors to those advancements in math, science, and technology. You expect them to be a bit behind the times, with the edgiest stuff more the focus of the master's degree programs. And I have to acknowledge that a data set involving just two people isn't really a statistically valid survey. These two chaps could be misinformed, willfully ignorant, or just plain mischievous. But why would they then drop $30 to buy a copy of a book on the topic unless they were confident in their assessment of their own reality? It certainly wasn't because they wanted my autograph. Well, distilling the discussion to its essence, I offer the following observations for any student out there wondering about their career selections and how best to position themselves for the future. Number one, chill. There's still lots of demand left in oil and gas. It will take years for the transition away from fossil fuels for transportation, and we still don't have a substitute for plastics. Oil and gas will need people for years. Digital areas are all experiencing double-digit growth, so there's plenty of work out there, even if oil and gas is a bit slow on the uptake. So don't quit. Number two, fix it. I can't explain why professional degrees have yet to respond to a trend that's been in the making for 15 years, but who cares? Besides, even if the programs wanted to put some digital into the program, they're going to have to drop something out. But what? Take ownership of your own career and inject into your study some emphasis on the new digital fields of study. There must be some optional or elective courses available on the key topics out there, like data science, programming, and user experience design. Number three. Be it. Be ready for the questions when they come. Claim to be a digital native and demonstrate it with a proper online presence. Take a tablet to your meetings. Frankly, just using LinkedIn properly will be a differentiator. Build your own mini AI engine or blockchain and your streets ahead. So in conclusion, while the Global Petroleum Show isn't the ideal location for career counseling, I'm happy to do my bit for the future. At least two future grads are going to be better off for the discussion. So good luck to Luke and Henry. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil & Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.